Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Well, I have a little introduction. So with your permission, away we go. Go on. Harvey Brooks is with us. He's joining us from Jerusalem. Born in New York, his contributions to the world of music are great. Harvey Brooks is a bassist and has recorded with everyone from Miles Davis to Bob Dylan. Also, John Sebastian, Luden Wainwright III, John Cale, Paul Butterfield Blues Band, just to name a few. In recent years, he wrote a memoir, View from the Bottom, and has recorded an album. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's always good to uh, connect. Yeah, it's amazing the technology we have nowadays. I still don't ever get over the fact that you're in Jerusalem and I'm here in the U.S. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll tell you though the the whole thing about this. There's lots of schools of thought, mm -hmm. but to be able to uh, communicate, uh, you know, in all different times of life, like you know, for uh, a lot of the things that I did uh, in writing the thing, I, uh, my wife and I and Frank Beecham wrote with me also. Frank Beecham is in Manhattan. And we've been talking and having all these discussions as if we were all in the same room. So it's an amazing phenomena to allow projects to happen even under the most dire circumstances such as COVID. True. Yeah, it's incredible. So it. tell the people out there, what's, what's a typical day like for you these days? Well, I've been, uh, my whole life, I've been kind of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I play, I write, I practice, um, I teach, uh, and I've been blessed with the most wonderful wife partner in the world who I share my time with. And um, uh, that's kind of what it is for me. I have a history. Uh, uh, I communicate with a lot of people and uh, uh, basically uh, stay active. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my love for music uh, kind of generates, uh, has generated through my life. And I've been fortunate enough to be uh, with uh, again, my wife and good people in, in this world to just keep on doing what I'm doing. So that's my days. <laughs> that's what I do. Well, this morning I started, I, I like to listen to music early on in the day. Uh -huh. And I started out and you know, a woman is special when someone writes a song about her. I'm hoping you can tell the viewers about Bonnie. Oh, well, it'd be my pleasure. Uh, Bonnie and I first met in junior high school in Queens Village, New York. Now, we went on to high school and I, I didn't know Bonnie that well, but she wrote Love Bonnie in my junior high school yearbook. And I took that to heart. <laughs> you know, I mean, I really had a crush on her. But to me, you know, I, I was just like some, you know, little kid. When we got to high school, you know, she, she was more sophisticated than me. And, and uh, uh, so we kind of went uh, uh, se separate ways. I, I became a musician and was out on the road uh, and recording and playing music. Uh, and she had an entirely different life. And then we hooked back up again uh, somewhere when I was about 45, 46 years old. And I knew her brothers, uh, Lloyd and Maury. And, and so, kind of in the circle, uh, she was working at a museum in Bridgeport and um, she was the director, media director there and uh, put on a rock and roll art and artifact exhibit. And through a mutual friend, she got my name. Uh, and when we spoke, she said, are you the same Harvey that I knew back in uh, high school in junior high school? And I said, yeah. You know, and, and as the way things worked out, we got back together and got married and we've been together ever since. So Bonnie, also my first love, my only real true love in this world. And uh, 
I'm very thankful uh, that we are together. And, and the song that I wrote, Bonnie's tune, and then it's just about that. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so since you're a music man, I'm hoping you can tell us what were the recordings? What was the stuff on the radio? What was it that you early on, the stuff that you really loved? Uh, well, I kind of, the, my sister introduced me to like doo-wop rock and roll. She's six years older than me. And the Cleftones and all these kind of doo-wop groups, street corner rock and roll that was huge in the 50s and uh, early 60s. Uh, Alan Freed, if people are familiar with that, he was a disc jockey who really pushed his music. So that was what I got introduced to. And then I got introduced, I won a, a dance contest with a friend and the prize was a B.B. King record, the blues. And so all of a sudden I had, now I was listening to the doo-wop and now I had B.B. King playing the blues and it wanted me to play guitar. So I started playing guitar. My parents gave me lessons. You know, I had a, a paper route to be able to uh, afford to buy a guitar. And then I started to play like B.B. King or in my mind, mm -hmm. I thought about that. And, and that got me started with music. Also, as well as a friend of mine who uh, uh, gave me some lessons and we played a few little gigs for 50 cents and my career started. Um, and then as uh, into the band, I started playing in a two guitar saxophone drum band and uh, we had a manager who said you need a bass player and it's bass they have these electric bass things now you don't have to carry that big bass you can just have an electric bass and so he said here try this so i did and the other guitar player was a more advanced guitar player i was a bass player and that started my career on the bass and when i listened to uh I started right out listening to uh, uh, Horace Silver. I was introduced to Horace Silver, to uh, uh, the Beatles, to the Rolling Stones, uh, uh, to Paul Chambers, to Miles Davis. Uh, uh, in New York, it was a, a, uh, an influx of all uh, Wilson Pickett, all of the Atlantic records, Ray Charles, that was kind of what I was listening to. Uh, I was playing in, uh, uh, I was doing touring when I was about, I started my first tour at 19 and I was playing with a band called The Exciters. Mm. And, and The Exciters had a hit called Tell em. And Tell em was a huge hit. And I was on tour up and down the coast, the East Coast during a blizzard. That was my first tour. And uh, it was a great experience. I'm, I'm back in New York and I'm playing in, in a club on 36th and 3rd um, with a trio. And I get a call from Al Cooper, who was a friend of mine from Queens, who turns me on to the Bob Dylan session. And they needed a bass player. And so I never listened to folk music. I never didn't know who Bob Dylan was. Uh, so my influences uh, uh, coming into our jazz and rhythm and blues. and uh, and, and a kind of basic doo-wop rock and roll. The thing about the old rock and roll is all those guys were jazz players. The drummers, that's why you had those great feels on those records hmm. you know, and the great basic bass. Everything was right in the pocket. And that's all the stuff I grew up on. A great variety of stuff there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Al Cooper, you just mentioned, this is a man who has made his mark on music in so many great recordings. How would you describe Al Cooper? Well, uh, he's, he's a, a genius. Um, in, he's a great, an amazing producer. Um, and he's a great songwriter. He's written great songs. And uh, that's it. Um, we don't talk too much anymore. Uh, 
but um, Al gave me my first shot uh, in, in getting uh, that Dylan session. And uh, uh, I took it from there. But Al is, uh, uh, like I said, he's a genius and a great songwriter. And uh, that's Al Cooper. He should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Uh, Recording studios are, are always fascinating to me because, you know, you think about here's this, here's this building or here's this room and what's yeah. going to come out of it is going to be something that people are going to hear everywhere. Can you remember the first time that you went into a recording studio? Yeah, I think the first time was in uh, Manhattan with Al Cooper. Uh, and it was one of the first things. And, and uh, it was an amazing thing because uh, I had no real prior knowledge to it, you know, I, I, what it was about. And uh, I realized, you know, that this here's something that I was doing, I was playing music, but now here is like all the people that I heard this is what they were doing to get their music out. Um, but I was, I was nervous, but comfortable and completely enthralled with the, the uh, technology of it. Mono, hmm. one track, you know, mic placement, you know, everything had to be a certain way. And you had to, uh, to get the sound you wanted, there were various tricks that you know you had to do all these kind of scenarios, and so like I, again, I started with the mono first track, and that one track. And as as I progressed, uh, I saw the whole industry, the whole recording life, you know, just grow uh, almost like year by year. I was like a baby every year to be in, add another track, two track stereo now. Whoa. Four track, quad, wow, what do you do with four track? Five, and then, then it went from four to eight, then eight to 12 and 12 to 24 and 24 to 36 while digital was coming in. So my first session, I loved it. And, and it made me want to do more, you know, and, and uh, that's kind of the essence of it. Did I answer the question? Yeah, I think you did. Yes, ab absolutely. Now, you were mentioning, and we should we should say that Bob Dylan is going to be turning eighty in just a few weeks now. When you first met him, what was your initial impression? What was it that you were thinking? Well, when I first met him, I walked into the studio, and he was standing by the console. I I, I talk about this in my book. Oh, by the way, that's what my book looks like. All right. Um, he's standing by the console and uh, he's listening to like a Rolling Stone. I'm walking in on this. I hadn't played on that. And so, and I'm listening to it, you know, and, and uh, Al Cooper comes up from the back and he introduces me to Dylan and Albert Grossman, Dylan's manager. And I'm looking at this frizzy haired guy, boots, jeans, skinny, short, small, and loving this music. You know, it's like a different sound. And so I'm walking into the, to the birth of, you know, folk rock. And, and so, and I dug it, I dug it. I thought it was uh, uh, fun. And I thought it was intelligent, you know, it was like a whole, it, it, you know, it, it, it was this uh, telling more of a reality, you know, it wasn't just a love song, which are wonderful, but it was a whole other insight to uh, what's going on in the world. Uh, and, and his rhyme schemes, and I'm listening to this, you know, and uh, so uh, I was very impressed not necessarily with musicianship, but with song and performance, you know, but I got to, in playing with him, I got to realize what a good musician he is. And like, he actually could do a lot of these things, 
you know, and he didn't need anybody to do it for him. But in this context, he brought in other people and it, and it worked. But he, he knew what he wanted. He knew when the performance was right. He knew that what was important was the performance, not was everybody in tune, not was everybody played the right parts. No, I felt right. That, you know, that's it. And so uh, a lot of lessons without, you know, not even knowing what was going on. So, yeah, that was my impression of Dylan. What does it feel like for you to know that those recordings, the, especially the 60s recordings, uh, the, 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 the two that you appeared on two albums, correct? Yeah. How does it feel knowing all these years later, there, there is probably somebody listening uh, in, undoubtedly to the tracks that you played on at this very second? You know, incredible life. Well, I, I tell you, it makes me feel two ways. The first way is it's an honor to be in something that has that kind of history. And number two, is I get royalties on that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so keep on listening. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what about the, the sessions that you did with John Sebastian? Can yeah. you tell us about that? Yeah, John, John's a wonderful, all around fabulous person and talented, great songwriter, great singer, great guitar player. Um, uh, the, uh, the sessions, it was on uh, uh, John Sebastian. Um, that was the album. I think it was, it was called that. Yeah, I think that was the debut. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and we did some great, we did some great songs. Uh, uh, Red Eye Express, I think, uh, and some other stuff. Uh, and, th and that was John really coming out as his own guy and uh, in full, big, what do you call the, uh, uh, all the shirts with the colors, I forget what they call that. Oh, tie-dye. Tie-dye. And yeah. he was screaming tie-dye. But he was, you know, John's just great. And over the years, I've known him. I've done a lot of stuff with him. He's always there, warm guy, and he's still he's still doing it. In in the production of it, the production was great. I think Jerry Ragavoy produced it. Oh, it was no Paul Rothschild produced it, and uh, it was great. It was just a great session. But go ahead. Of all the different sessions that you've done, I was mentioning at the beginning of the show. These iconic, you know, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, John Cale, Miles Davis. Is there a session that to you is the, it, it's the most special or the most meaningful to you? Well, for some reason, I keep coming up with Seals and Croft. Huh. A summer Breeze and Hummingbird. Uh, the mild, they're, they're kind of like different animals, right? That was, I mean, I think they're fabulous songwriters and great singers and great songs and great musicians that I played with on that. And, and I just think it was one of the best things that I, I was ever a part of. Miles Davis, on the other hand, this was more than music. This was like a, an experience of life, you know, to, to play with, that level of masters and uh, for me to come in there and actually have a place and, uh, you know, be a part of it, uh, that, you know, that those was, there were only, I think two sessions, two days we did, and they got a lot of stuff out of it. Uh, and I met Tio Macero, he, who got me on the session. I was producing at Columbia at the time and Tio had the office next to me and he, uh, you know, he said, he called me up. He said, hey, come on over for some coffee. I said, hey, Tia, what's up? He said, uh, look, Miles is doing a demo for his wife, Betty. So he needs, he wants to try electric bass. So, so right there, I, I walked into an amazing scenario uh, with, with Betty. And I, and I met uh, uh, Mitch Mitchell was playing drums, John McLaughlin on guitar. Uh, Joe Zawinol playing piano. 
just amazing group of players. And um, so there were those sessions, you know, and, and uh, the sessions with Miles were total uninhibited. You had to go, like he wanted for me a bottom. And it was, the music was whatever we did. And he directed us to play, not to play and go. And then he and Tio edited to make it make sense, to make it all sit in place. And Tio uh, is a monster. Um, those are great sessions. Uh, the Seals and Cross sessions were great. Um, uh, there's probably a lot more, <laughs> but, but uh, those two always kind of jump out to me. Uh, yeah. What would you say was the biggest thing you learned from this experience with Miles Davis? Um, I think the biggest, the, the biggest thing is um, Uh, to be able to just go without really thinking about it, how to react. Because what I was doing was reacting to what was going on around me. And so I'm reacting and what's coming from me is my reaction to what the other players are doing. And so at the same time, uh, you know, in my brain, I'm, it's implanted, your mission is to get bottom. So I'm laying down in the bottom and I'm playing with one of the best bass players in the world, Dave Holland, who's playing upright and who is a total master and is playing all this great melodic stuff. And I'm just lying down there, you know, just doing my little thing. And I had to concentrate to stay there. I'm listening, I'm concentrating and, uh, I think probably more than anything else was the uh, reacting to what was going on, not being caught up in myself. Hmm. So you're playing with these incredible musicians on those sessions. What's yeah. it like for you the first time you listen back to the recording? Well, okay, let me say a couple of things. First thing, I'm, I walked in nervous hmm. and feeling like I'm over my head, you know? But one thing I know is that if you want to get better, you always go for playing with better musicians or anybody that can teach you. But at the same time, I'm relatively confident about my abilities to survive in any environment. <laughs> uh, so, um, my aunt would tell me, what's the question again? Oh, I was saying, uh, what was That's it like right. for you? You listened back to these recordings with Miles. Yeah. Okay, so when I listened back to that, uh, I didn't get it, to be honest. I did not get it. I, I listened and I said, wow. Uh, when I heard the edited version, it made more sense to me. Because there are the things... Uh, Editing is an instrument, especially in a free form like that, when it's being recorded. Um, so when I heard, when I listened to what the released edited version was, um, I liked it better. But I, I was not really a fan of it. You know, I, I, it was I, more than me. You know, but I was on this incredible, I contributed uh, my musicianship, uh, but it, it took me about another 20 years before I could really understand what had happened. Hmm. I think that's probably the reality of that. Now, with your incredible resume in music, in Jerusalem, do you have a reputation? Do people know, oh, there walks Harvey Brooks? Well, the, all, all the musicians in town know I'm here. Mm -hmm. you know, I, but I haven't really, um, I have some people that I play with. I did, I recorded this uh, album with um, who are uh, wonderful players. Uh, Orrin Fried, a drummer, a great drummer. Uh, Steve Peskoff, a guitar player, wonderful guitar player. Uh, uh, Yehuda. Uh, Ashash, who's 
engineered was his studio and he's a great bay play based on a couple of tunes um wonderful guys um a, a saxophone player my downstairs neighbor turned out to be this great sax player from from uh, chile uh his name is yoram linker and so these guys are great and i've been playing with you know we do occasional gigs i don't go to clubs anymore and you know uh, uh i can't deal with the uh uh, the environment that much anymore. Uh, not because of any other reason, except uh, they don't pay. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and but, but more than that, um, I was very blessed to have uh, an exceptional songwriter, uh, Ehud Benai, songwriter, singer, and a pop star in, in Jerusalem, in Israel, all over, who uh, uh, we met uh, actually on the internet. Bonnie uh, ran into him on the internet. She liked his website. And when we moved uh, to Israel, he's the first person that came over with a bottle of wine and welcomed us. It was wonderful. Hmm. But like I say, there's great players here. Another guy named Donnie Sanderson. Uh, he had a group called Pookie and some other, and just fabulous and helped out on the album. Uh, so, my, my musical experience here is I'm listening, I'm hearing, and uh, it's starting to affect uh, my music. Uh, although I'm still the same guy, I'm singing for the first time. And this is kind of what I've wanted to do. I've, I've done all, you know, I've been a side man, I have been a good one. Uh, and I, I'm not so much into that anymore. Now I, I just, I'm kind of working on my own music, my own songs, um, and express kind of what some of the conclusions I've come to. Uh, and I don't want to, you know, waste energy. Uh, uh, if I'm going to play, I want it to be something meaningful, an, an opportunity. And, and, and if it's, there's no opportunity, it's, it's a crazy world. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. True. We don't know if there are any more venues, you know. But uh, I, I have been blessed to have musical people here in Israel uh, to talk to and, and uh, trade music with over the COVID year. And, yeah. and I'm here uh, going on 11, 12 years. And like I say, I've met a lot of wonderful musicians. And it's a very vital, vibrant musical society. So that's the story with that. So you go from being a sideman and then you do this album and you're singing, you know, uh, yeah. what was that experience like for you to, to record yourself singing songs? Songs that you wrote? Yeah, it's, well, now, I told my wife that, you know, my dream was to do a book, go through all my, I mean, I guess I'm kind of like an ego person. Uh, you know, do a book and do an album of, uh, sing, with me singing. And what she did was she made my dreams come true by supporting me, by being there, you know, and not letting me get away with crap, you know, and, you know, make me serious about everything, you know, and mostly about love and, and being a human being. We have family here that's wonderful, grandchildren, great grandchildren. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so, okay, so like now, um, in my opinion about stuff, my thoughts, without uh, you know, being in a position to take a position, you know, I'm not saying uh, the quality of what I do, everything is taste-based. Some folks may like what I'm doing, some folks may not, but I got it out, and I'm trying to get it out as much as I can now. And so if anybody wants to go up and, uh, check it out on Spotify or go to Amazon or uh, iTunes to buy it. That would be great. You know, you're supporting a good cause. Uh, but that's kind of like uh, what I'm doing and, and my music is progressing. Uh, and uh, I'm also working on a uh, audio book of, which is a very strange thing to do. It's very strange to, buy, to write about yourself. <laughs> That's strange because you see 
the stupid things you've done in life, you know, the smart things, the stupid things, and somehow the stupid things kind of outweigh the smart things at least in my life, uh, except for the smartest thing I ever did, which was had myself together enough to meet my wife. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's an amazing, so now I'm talking about this book that has quotations of other people. Frank did some wonderful interviews with other people. So now I'm talking about it. And then now I'm, I'm talking about people talking about me. So it's a little weird, uh, but I figured, well, let's say, look, it's him. He's doing this, well, what the heck? But, so you stick me in the car as you're going somewhere and uh, you listen to Harvey uh, talking about himself. Do you have a title for the audio book yet? Uh, it's, it's probably going to be a uh, view from the bottom. Same thing. Okay. I mean, it's because it's the book and, and it's our, and if anybody's going up to buy the book and you want to go into Google or something, go Harvey Brooks view from the bottom. Oh, okay. I get you. right to it. And, uh, get firsthand knowledge. That's right. <laughs> so what the, the experience of, of, recalling all of these memories writing your you know your experiences your your memories and thoughts yeah was there anything that surprised you about writing the memoir uh i always thought my, of myself as an intelligent person you know and so right away i'm in trouble you know <laughs> starting off with that kind of thinking uh, but just how many, how many bad decisions I made at crucial times, you know, like I had the opportunity to go to tour with Miles and I turned it down and I went in another direction. Uh, I was also producing, I had an album to do, which I could have postponed, but, you know, I was, I said, well, I don't know about this. I was not, you know, a little uh, nervous about stepping over my head and that was a big mistake uh that, that was one i mean it was a lot of those kind of things I, there were things uh had i had uh good advice with me i might have done differently but i was not a good business person i didn't have contracts all the time you know i went along because i love the music so much yeah i'm yours <laughs> oh, oh 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 there's a problem uh I don't have a contract. I can't get paid. You know, those kind of things happen. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you make, I made a lot of wrong decisions. I made a lot of right decisions, but in going through it and having to come to terms with my own stupidity uh, and with mistakes that I made that, that I could have done something else and that I let pride and I let ego rule my decisions. Uh, but overall, I, you know, I'm the cheapest shrink I could have gone to, you know, mm. you know, doing this, I advise people, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong in your life or what, what the problems were, or what's good in your life, just retrospect yourself, start writing and thinking about those things and write it out, you know, it might be a good idea, but, um, I think in doing it, it made me a much better person. You know, I, you know, just, I exposed myself, you know, talking about what kind of fool I was with drugs and alcohol and, and uh, you know, lifestyle. I get into it into the book and uh, more than I thought I would, you know, and worrying about, I've got grandchildren and grandkids. They're, they're step grandchildren and grandkids, but they're still mine. And, and uh, we love each other and they're reading, if they are reading this, which I, I hope they're not, but they probably are. Uh, it's not that much, you know, it's not that big a deal. But um, yeah, so, you know, I'm 76 and uh, I'm feeling good. Life is good. That's good. Yeah. So what's the best thing about living there in Jerusalem? I can only speak for myself. Uh, as a uh, 
uh, as a musician, um, I'm exposed to all different kinds of music, uh, Arab music, uh, uh, Jewish music, Russian music, uh, French music. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's a very international city. Um, great public transportation, great museums, a lot of culture. Um, it's a uh, it's a lifestyle. You know, you're surrounded by uh, uh, an upsetting world, uh, and a lot of things trying to figure themselves out. But I per feel perfectly safe. Uh, I feel safer than a lot of other places I could be. Uh, the people are, <laughs> a friend of mine said, Israel is one of these places where if you have a solution, we have a problem for it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like Israelis go for the gusto all the time. And I love that. You know, uh, I'm always trying to figure it out. Uh, a lot of things get done here. This is a very energetic and a very smart, uh, but at the same time, um, we're dealing with a lot of re uh, religious issues um, that have been going on for thousands of years. I mean, this is, and will probably go on for, no, no matter what we work out, it's gonna go on forever. Hmm. Um, because religion is a core part of humanity. You know, there are those that say, well, no religion, no this, no that. This one's better than that one. But whatever it is, the conversation continues. Um, and we're all trying and just trying to get along. Um, but, uh, you know, it's uh, the best olives, <laughs> the best hummus. Uh, but, you know, this has been it, it was surrounded by insanity. And um, uh, hopefully um, the whole world has had an opportunity to kind of cleanse. And, you know, I'm saying this in the most humble, general way. I mean, people dying the way they have been, although it, it happens with flu and all other things, but this kind of plague feeling is just a, a terrible thing. And it's forced a lot of things to come to a head, a lot of relationships between people and so on and so forth. But I don't wanna to get too much into it because I could start going here. <laughs> uh, but I like to just stay in the music and, and to say that my intention is to really bring more music and to maintain what I do, like the way I make music. You know, which is I take a little bit of what's going on, a little pinch of this, a little pinch of that. I, I understand the technology uh, and I use it uh, somewhat, but I combine it with, I, I combine analog and digital. I combine all of the possibilities to come up with something that's new, but is tasteful, you know, and, uh, but then, and it's all a matter of taste as to whether anybody likes anything. The music, the way the music business is now, you know, you know, you have to put things out all over the place, but it's it's not that easy to make a living because yeah. it, it's just like in real life. There's a small percentage up top that make all the money and everybody else is fighting for the, for the uh, shekels. Hmm. And, and uh, so within that, you, you have to love your music. You know, and if you're just doing it for the money, ooh, something else. <laughs> uh, so I think that's that's kind of my story. What's the best thing about being Harvey Brooks? <laughs> um, the best thing about being Harvey Brooks is I've been very fortunate to have opportunities and was able to meet the opportunity. When the door opened, I was able to step in and do it. Now, one could say, well, somebody else could have done it better. Somebody else could have done it worse, but I got in and I did it. I took advantage of the opportunity 
and that gave me more opportunities to do what I love, which is play music and create music. And so that's kind of my thing. You know, I've had up, I've been in places and I took advantage of opportunities and open doors gave me other opportunities. Um, when the mistakes were made, I was able to come back from it. I never gave up. I went to the edge, but didn't fall over. I stepped back and I said, oh, I have more things to do. And I go back the other way, back to being a sane person, you know. And I was able to get it together enough to allow my wife to love me and to, you know, to accept me as where I had been. And when I said I'm giving all that life up, you know, she took me at my word and uh, I did. And so I'm proud of that. And I'm and thankful to her. Not that she she's amazing in her own right. It's not like she's my keeper. You know, we keep each other, you know, and she's, um, you know, just a very powerful woman. And she's a great artist. Uh, she's a great blogger. She's a, a media person. She's an amazing mother, grandmother, great grandmother. Just so. So that's uh, me. Hmm. Well, would you hold up the book one more time for everybody out there? My Tell pleasure. them the best way to get this book. The best way to get to this book is to, uh, this time you can go to tangiblepress.net. That's the publisher and you can get it from him. You can go online to, uh, uh, iTunes, uh, Amazon, uh, Book Depository, which pays for the shipping, um, Barnes and Noble, and pretty much any online uh, uh, sales site, um, you'll be able to get the book. And pretty much the same thing uh, with the music. And the name of the album the back cover here elegant geezer elegant geezer <laughs> the jerusalem sessions okay the title is mainly that well, well hard i appreciate your uh, uh allowing me this time to spout and babble <laughs> it's my pleasure uh, uh, you 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 made me feel like i've known you for a long time so <laughs> Thank you, Harvey Brooks. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, sir. I'll see you again. Until next time. Bye.